photo editing is such a personal thing. Everybody has their own take on how a photo should look, and that's a great thing. But over the years, I've noticed some common mistakes that myself and a lot of other photographers are making. So in today's video, I'm gonna be sharing seven photo editing mistakes that I see all of the time, but more importantly, how you can correct those mistakes. Hello and welcome back. So in today's video, I'm gonna share some mistakes that I have definitely been guilty of in the past. And to be honest, I probably still make from time to time. And I hope by sharing these mistakes, it will help you to improve your photography editing as well. Now, of course, you know, photography as a whole is very, very subjective. And it's definitely not for me to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. But if you like your images to have a very natural looking appearance, then I'm sure you're gonna to find today's video very, very helpful. So let's get straight into the first mistake. The first mistake I definitely have been guilty of in the past and I often see it online is overly lifted shadows. And by this, I mean when a photo has significant contrast, but the shadows have been lifted so much that they end up being a similar luminance value as the very well lit areas. And to me, this looks pretty unnatural and it kind of immediately turns me off from wanting to explore that photograph further. Take this image here. If I was to brighten up the shadow, yes, we can see more detail in the shot, but does that actually help the composition or actually does it make it worse? Now, when I'm editing, I always try to remember, you know, what it was actually like when I was there in the field shooting the photograph. You know, especially if we're shooting towards the light, you know, more often than not, those shadows are gonna be very dark, to the point possibly of being completely black, you know. So why not, you know, show that in the photo? I think there's actually a common misconception in photo editing that we mustn't clip the details in the shadows or the highlights. But if something is pure black, then, you know, why not show it as pure black? I think one of the, you know, the fundamentals, if you like, of photography is, I guess, the interplay between light and shadow. In a lot of cases, I think that, you know, shadows are probably as, or if not more important to the composition than the light in some circumstances. So yeah, I'm always mindful of not lifting my shadows too much. The next mistake I've been guilty of is not cropping my photos. So I definitely went through a phase of having to get my crop absolutely perfect in camera. And while I think this is a good approach to take, there are times when it can become detrimental to the final image. So as you can see here, if I bring up the crop tool and press O on the keyboard, it will bring up the crop overlay tool. And this can be great for you know, getting creative with your crop. But this one here shows different crop ratios and it's probably my most helpful tool in my opinion. If we press L, we can turn the lights off, allowing us to be more focused on our work. And this is great for seeing whether a different crop ratio would better suit an image. My approach is if there's not enough interest or you know, it doesn't help the composition, I tend to crop it out. I sometimes think that less can definitely be more. Cropping is also a great way of removing distractions that are creeping into the edges of your frame as well. Now, another reason cropping your photos can be really helpful is when we have, say, depth of field issues. So say we have a very, very complex scene like this one here and say I was shooting at say 25 millimeters for the perfect crop and I wanted to get everything sharp from front to back. Well, I might not be able to get that front to back sharpness without focus stacking the image at that focal length. Now, while stacking is fine in a lot of situations, if it's windy, it can be very, very, very difficult. You know, it's difficult to blend those images in post-production, especially if you've got say flowers or grasses blowing around in your foreground. So an approach we could take is to shoot at a wider focal length and then crop in a little bit in post-production. So typically the wider our focal length, the more depth of field we have. So zooming out by say five millimeters might give us that extra little bit of depth of field that we require to get the shot in one photo as opposed to having to focus stack if we shot with a tighter focal length. Yes, we're gonna lose a little bit of resolution when we crop in later, but it might be the difference between getting the shot and not. And actually, sometimes it's much easier to crop in post-production than it is to do a very, very difficult focus stack. I hope that makes sense. The wider the shot, the more depth of field we have, which is super helpful, especially when we don't want to focus stack an image. 
Often this is actually giving you a better result than say stopping the aperture down to say f16 or f22 because then diffraction sets in and the image can be quite soft. So it's definitely a technique that can be very, very handy for certain situations, yeah. So next up we've got the dreaded vignette. No, seriously, I use the vignette quite a lot, but I think I use it in a more subtle way than I used to. I think I was a little bit heavy handed with it in the past. So if you're not familiar with a vignette, basically it's the darkening down of the edges of your photo. And you can do this to draw focus to certain parts of your image. Now, I do think it works really well. However, I think it can also be a distraction if it's applied too heavily. So an easy way of applying a vignette in Lightroom is to come down to the vignette tool and just bring that vignette in until you're happy. But this method doesn't give us that much control. I found actually a better way to do it is to use the radial filter in the masking section and then invert that selection. The beauty of this is that we can size it to suit the shot and we now have all of the adjustments that are available to us in the basics panel as well. For example, we could darken the shadows but not the highlights. And this gives us so much more control. For even greater control, we can intersect the mask with another tool and choose only to paint in the effect to the image in certain areas. So this gives us so much more flexibility than the standard vignette tool. Now, when you've finished your vignette, a great way of seeing if you've overdone it is to reduce the size of your image on the screen. If we press Command and the minus key, the photo becomes a lot smaller and the vignette is easier to see. And straight away, you'll notice if it's too obvious. Now, for me, I want the vignette to draw the eye into the scene, but I don't want the viewer to be able to notice that I've applied a vignette. Obviously, that's just my personal preference though. So I just try and treat it as subtle as possible. So mistake number four is only using global adjustments. So if you're not familiar with the phrase global adjustments, it's when we make an adjustment and it applies that adjustment to everything in the photo. Now, this can work well for many photos and almost all of my photos have some kind of global adjustments made to them. But I think more often than not, you may find that certain parts of your photo will need to be treated differently to others. So take the sky, for example, which is too bright. If I reduce the global exposure, the foreground is gonna to become too dark. So I may need to treat the sky differently to the rest of the shot. And this is where masks come in really, really handy. Now Lightroom has a great sky detection mask, which will select the sky for you, meaning you can adjust the sky separately to the rest of your photo. Similarly, you can use the sky detection mask to invert it and only affect the land portion in your photo. Now there's tons of other ways to use masks as well, too many to cover in this specific video, but if you're interested in learning more about photo editing, you may find my online classes really, really helpful. Alongside my Lightroom Masterclass, every fortnight I put out a new editing session where you can download one of my RAW files and follow along with me. So if you're interested in taking a look at that, there is a link down in the video description. And if you sign up today, you'll get 40% off. So yeah, why not take a look? Next up is something I've been guilty of on multiple occasions, and that's over sharpening a photo. And I think it's so easy to get carried away with the sharpening sliders. And I believe the amount of sharpening we apply depends on various factors, you know, such as personal taste, equipment, the resolution of your camera. And because of this, it's really hard for me to say exactly what you should or shouldn't do. But I think a couple of pointers would be to pay attention to where you're applying that sharpening. So, for example, we don't really need to sharpen the sky in our photos. And if we do that, essentially what we're going to do is just accentuate the noise in the sky area. Similarly, if we have out of focus areas in the image, they really don't need sharpening either. So. I think for me, it's the fine details that I actually like to sharpen. Now we can be selective about what we sharpen using the masking slider here in Lightroom. Now if we apply some sharpening, then hold down Alt and drag the masking slider to the right, we can mask out different parts of the image. The, we, the more we slide it to the right, the more the details are masked out, meaning we can select just the fine details to have that sharpening applied to. And this can be such a powerful way of sharpening your image and it's super quick as well. Mistake number six I've definitely made in the past is not exporting multiple different files at once. So what I mean by this is that in the past I would say finish my edit, export it to my hard drive 
and I was done, you know, kind of happy days. But then whenever I wanted to post a photo somewhere else, like on YouTube or the web or social media, I'd have to go back to Lightroom, find the photo and export it to that correct size. And in my opinion, it just wasted a ton of time. So what I tend to do now when I've finished an edit, I will export multiple different versions of that file all at once and name them for their specific purpose. So one will be high res, one will be YouTube, one will be for my website, one will be for Instagram. And I'll put them all in the same folder so that at any point in the future, you know, I can just come back to them and post an image without having to go back into Lightroom, try and find the photo and then export it. Now, the beauty of resizing you know, the photos yourself is that you're not relying on the platform for, to do that for you. So for example, if you upload an image to Facebook, for example, it's gonna apply its resizing on upload. And more than likely, it's not gonna look as nice as if you uploaded the correct dimensions yourself. So yeah, bit of a bit of a time saver this one, but you know, it all adds up, doesn't it? And it's, it's well worth doing. I'll do it every single time I finish an edit now. So tip number seven is over editing in general. And I think this is so easy to do. I just think I've accepted it's unlikely, you know, that I'm gonna get it perfect on the first try. And I think we have to remember that when we adjust, say contrast, for example, it's actually affecting other things in the image too. So bumping up contrast will also increase saturation. So, you know, if you go heavy on contrast, you might not need to add any saturation at all. Now, as well, like color shift is another thing to watch out for. You know, typically our eyes adjust to color. So when we start color correcting something, we can sometimes think it's right, but on reflection, it's our eyes adjusting to that specific color. So my advice is for all edits is to get it about 95% of the way there, then go away and let your eyes readjust, then make a few more tweaks. And if you've got time, you know, even come back the next day to evaluate it. And this is especially helpful if you're sharing your work online, you know, it could save you a turn of embarrassment. I've been there, I've been there definitely. There's nothing worse than posting images and then going back to them at a later date and thinking, oh my God, you know, what was I thinking? You know, so yeah, just, uh, you know, something to think about. Anyway, while avoiding these mistakes will definitely help you to improve your editing, taking on board these photography insights could also help you enjoy your photography a heck of a lot more. So I highly recommend checking the video out that's up there somewhere. And if you enjoy this video, please be sure to give it a like. That really does help me out and subscribe for more weekly content. And the link up here somewhere will take you to the Photographer's Clubhouse where you can follow along with my editing sessions. Anyway, I hope to see you all again next week. Take care.